Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, be reading verses 1 through 11. I made mention of the Christ cross. And if we notice, around the bottom of the Christ cross, there are gifts. And when we read the story about the birth of Jesus Christ, one of the things that comes into play is the fact that there were gifts involved in his birth. And those gifts were important gifts. They were gifts that had an absolute standard and had an absolute reason. I'm always amazed by humanity. We always find a way, seemingly, to turn everything toward us. Let me give you an example of that. At Christmas, or Christ Mass, or that time of year that we choose to remember that a Savior was born, that God gave us a gift of his love and his grace and his goodness and his mercy, that he gave gifts to us, we claim to remember that day, we claim to make it special, not by bringing gifts to Christ, but giving gifts to each other. Isn't that the humanity of man? Instead of giving gifts to Jesus, instead of coming to him and worshiping him with gifts as we're told in the word of God, it doesn't tell me that wise men gave gifts to one another. It doesn't tell me that all the children in Israel received little bundles and little presents. It doesn't tell me that there was some magical man that flew through the sky on Christmas Eve. No! God's word tells me that the people that were involved brought gifts to Jesus. When are we going to grow up? When are we going to mature in God's word? When are we going to spiritually realize that the things we've allowed to go on have led our society astray? We've raised generations and generations and generations of children to believe that Christmas is about them getting Christmas gifts and presents. And sadly, most of them cannot identify with the fact that Christmas is all about giving. It's not about getting. And that it's about giving to the right source, giving to the Savior of the world. I want to read God's Word, Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it's written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you found him, Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went from before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him and opened their treasures. They offered him gifts. Pay attention to that. They offered him gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
Loved ones, it's easy to fall into Christmas trapping. I read a story about a, a wife that woke up one morning and she rolled over to her husband. She said, honey, wake up. Wake up. He kind of came to. She said, I just had a wonderful dream. It was a, it was a great dream. And he's I was still about halfway asleep. He said, what, what was it? What, what was the dream? She said, I dreamed that you gave me a thousand dollars. And you told me to go to the store and buy a new wardrobe for Christmas. The man said, yeah, really? She said, yes. She said, and it was so wonderful and I, I felt the love in it. And she said, you, you wouldn't do anything in the world to spoil that dream for me, would you? And her husband looked at her and said, honey, absolutely not. Keep the $1,000. Y'all will get that in a minute. Some of you will be a little delayed. We have so many misconceptions about Christmas. And the worst misconceptions that we ever play with our children, and I don't care what you call me, is to teach them about Santa Claus and reindeers and Christmas trees. And we miss the truth of God's Word. Now let me give you an example of something. How many of you know that in God's Word that it tells us there are three wise men that went to see Jesus? How many of you know? Some of you raised your hands? Okay. Now I understand that, that we could believe that, but did you know God's Word does not say there was three wise men? It does not say that. It says there were three gifts, but not three wise men. Look at verse 1 in our text. Behold, wise men from the east. doesn't say three wise men, yet we have misconstrued and misunderstood, and through the years I get Christmas cards every year, and you see in, in some of these Christmas cards, there's three wise men in the stable gathered around the manger, and that's not to be found in God's Word. But we believe it. I read about a church that was going to put on a Christmas pageant. And they decided to cancel it and they weren't even going to have it. And one of the deacons came to the pastor later and said, why did, you, why did you cancel the Christmas pageant? The pastor said, I couldn't find three wise men and I couldn't find any virgins. I'm afraid that's kind of where we are in society. It's another example of how we misunderstand the Christmas story and we misunderstand the birth of Christ. The wise men were not present on the night that Christ was born. God's Word is very, very clear. By the way, now I've told you all this before, but I'm going to see how, how well you listen. What occupation were the wise men? Does anybody know? I didn't, there's a guy by, Tim ought to know. Tim, you ought to know this. No, he's saying, no, not me. The wise men were firemen. Because God's Word says they came from afar. That's what it says. I'm just reading my Bible. But listen, if we read the story, we find out that the Wise men came to Jerusalem when they saw the star. But where were they before they went to Jerusalem? Because if they went to Jerusalem, they had to travel there. Right? They weren't in Jerusalem. And Bethlehem is a three to four day walk from Jerusalem. So at the very best, they were probably a week away from Bethlehem. Now I want you to pay attention to verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Notice it does not say they went into the stable. It doesn't say they were with the donkeys. It says they went into the house and saw the child. 
Do you see how easy it is for us to draw misconceptions about Christmas? About what it means? And I wonder sometimes if the simplicity and the accuracy of God's Word is not the most important thing in our lives. It ought to be above everything else. It ought to be above every story that we ever tell our children. Anything that we ever share should be on the authority of God's Word. And the Bible says that when they visited Jesus, they brought gifts. Now listen to me. When the wise men saw Jesus is not nearly as important as why they saw Jesus, and what they brought to Jesus. In verse 11 it says, then opening their treasures. Treasures. We had a time at the beginning of the service when we had an opportunity to share with our Savior. When we had an opportunity to give to Him. I don't want to see your hand, but I wonder how many of us really gave him any treasure. Normally, we give him what's left over. Normally, we give him some pittance. Normally, we give him something that we feel like won't cramp us. I like what a man told me one time. He said, John, you haven't given to Jesus till it hurts. When it hurts, you've given. I wonder how often we really give our treasures. We all, we're we're good about throwing a dollar in the offering plate. But what about our treasures? What are treasures? Treasures are something that's valuable. Treasures have great worth. Last week I I showed a picture of my, my deceased, rusty, Bud Honey. And how I talked about how I look forward about seeing him in heaven. Now I've replaced Rusty with a Dusty. He's the same breed of dog. And I love him to death. And he's the sweetest little thing. And he's reminding me of Rusty all the time. But when we talk about treasures, I was looking at Dusty and I was watching Dusty this morning. You know what they say? Your treasure is where your heart is. And little Dusty wants to be with me. And he can't wait till I get up in the morning. He is outside that door waiting for me to get up in the morning and just can't wait for me to open the door just so he can be with me. And he'll come and I'll sit down in the recliner and he gets up in my lap and wants, just wants to be with me and he just lays there. So, you know what? That's where his treasure is. And listen to us, loved ones. Our treasure is with Jesus Christ. There's Dusty. She's surprised. I didn't know she was going to have Dusty up there. There's Dusty Bud Honey. Ain't he cute? Looks just like me, don't he? He's my boy. I love you. But listen to me. Our treasure is where our heart is. Is your treasure with Jesus? Is that your desire? Is that everything that drives you in your life? Is it every reason that you get up every morning? Is it every reason that you go to bed at night? Is it every reason that you raise your children? Is it every reason that you have your job? Is it every reason that you go out into society? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And I notice in this passage of Scripture, it could have said, oh, they brought him a box. They brought him a gift sack. No. It says they brought him something valuable. Something of great worth. They brought him treasures. And in this passage of Scripture, we're told that each gift that the wise men brought to Jesus was chosen. It was chosen to signify the attributes of a king. The authority of royalty the applicability of lordship, and it ought to give us pause to think about what do we bring to Him 
in treasures. What's important to us? The wise men gave Jesus gifts, and I want you to know something. Those gifts continue to give today. They just keep on giving and keep on giving and keep on giving over and over and over again in our lives. Now I made mention of the Christ cross. I love the Christ cross. It's beautiful. I'd rather have a Christ cross than a Christmas tree. Sabata, come here. I need you to help me. I want you to come help preacher today. See that that sack right there? Would you hand that to me, please? That gold sack right there. Thank you, son. Thank you. Okay, you can go back. Sit down. Thank you. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning in God's Word, we're told that the wise men brought gifts. And the first gift that they brought to Jesus, boy, Kathleen, you packed these things good, didn't you hear? I'm going to throw this stuff around. Look here. They brought him a gift of sovereignty. They brought him gold. Now, loved ones, I don't need to tell you the importance of gold. Everything in our society, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, is based on the value of gold. The money that you carry around in your pocket, that you wish you had in your checking account, that the government wants to take away from you at every turn, it's based on gold. Gold is an important commodity. Gold is a valuable commodity. But I want you to know that the gold is a gift of sovereignty. Look at verse 11. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. And the first one is gold. Gold is reserved for royalty. I read about a man being a pilot. I'm always interested about airplanes. And I read about, believe it or not, he was an evangelist in Ohio. I don't know how evangelists get to this point. But he had bought a 747 aircraft from a Saudi prince. And I looked through the pictures of the aircraft and I couldn't believe it. It blew me away. The insides, the stairway up into the airplane was 14 karat gold. Inside, when you entered into the 747 aircraft, you saw the, the lush and plush seats, and they were outlined in gold leaf. I want you to know that gold is reserved for royalty. And it wasn't an accident, and it didn't just happen, that the wise men happened to bring Gifts of gold to Jesus. Because I want you to know, Jesus is royalty. And the wise men knew that He was a man of royal virtue. And He was man and He was God. Jesus was proclaimed a king at His birth. In verse 2 it says, Where is He who has been born King of the Jews? But not only was he proclaimed king at birth, he was proclaimed king at his death. In John chapter 19, Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But he just wasn't just proclaimed king at his birth and king at his death. Jesus was titled a king by the very prophets. Isaiah chapter 9 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Jesus is king at birth. Jesus is king at death. Jesus is proclaimed king by the prophets and Jesus is proclaimed king by the angels. Look in our story, Luke chapter 1. 
he shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Most Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus Christ is king, and I want you to know something. He is not a figurative king. He's not a future king. He's not a fictional king. Jesus Christ is king. He's the Lord of glory. He's the son of the sovereign God, the creator of the entire universe. He was foreordained. He's fundamental. He's foundational. He's king of kings, and he's Lord of lords. He's king of love and life. He's the king of our hearts and of our heritage. He's the king of godliness. He's the king of goodness. King Jesus is the sovereign source of salvation. And Jesus may have arrived as a, as a baby in a manger, but I want you to listen to me this morning. He's going to return as a majestic, Grand, glorious, sovereign, savior, and ruler of the universe. That's my Jesus. Revelation chapter 19 says, Then I saw heaven open, behold a white horse. The one sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and his name has written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword from which to strike down the nations. And he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He'll tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written. King of kings. Lord of lords. Listen to me this morning. Don't cheapen Jesus. Don't cheapen him with his cheesy Christmas junk. It doesn't belong around him. He's almighty. He's the sovereign God of glory. He's the soon coming king. He's the redeemer. He's the righteous one. He's the risen one. We need to remember he's royal. And he's coming back. And he's coming back in veracity. He's coming back in vitality, and He's coming back in vengeance. And when Jesus returns, it'll signal the defeat of sin. Because King Jesus, King Jesus is a God of victory. Listen to me, He's victorious by His very nature. In Revelation chapter 19, it says, Then I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True and Righteous. That's his nature. He's victorious by nature. And notice the victorious character of the king. Faithfulness. Truthfulness. Righteousness. Our world is perishing for a lack of faithfulness truthfulness, and righteousness. And the kingdom of Christ Jesus will be characterized by truth and justice and honesty and love. Think about this. No more lying, stealing politicians. No more corrupt justice system. No more radicalism and racism immaturity and immorality, hatred, no more headaches, no more heartaches. He's victorious by his nature because his nature is royal. But not only is he victorious by his nature, he's victorious by his very name. His name is victory. Revelation chapter 19 says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. King of kings. Lord of lords. 
The baby that was born in Bethlehem has no rival. There is no president that comes close to him. There is no prince that can match him. There is no politician that could ever defeat him. He bears the name as the creator of the universe. And mark my words, someday everyone's going to know his name. And not only will they know his name, they're going to call his name. And they're going to bow before his name. And they're going to exalt his name. And in Philippians chapter 2 it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah to the risen Lamb! It ain't Santa Claus. It's not. His name is royal. I remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and asked about eternal life. And he, the Bible tells us he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he was lost. Because Jesus said, Sell what you have, give it all away, take up your cross and follow me. And he said, hmm, don't think so today. No, not me. That's a, that's a hill too high to climb. I can't go that far. And he left sorrowful. Yasser Arafat of the Palestinian Liberation Organization spent his entire life hating and persecuting Jews. But I want you to know something. One day, his knee will bow. And he will confess. Adolf Hitler died lost. He annihilated Jews one after the other in the thousands and thousands and thousands. But one day, at the name of Jesus, his knee will bow. And his tongue will confess that he is King of kings, he is Lord of lords, to the glory of God the Father. Loved ones, listen, remember this morning, Jesus is victorious by His nature. He's victorious by His name. But listen, He's victorious by necessity. Necessity. I want you to think about this. The birth of Jesus was necessary. Not only was it necessary to pay the sin debt of mankind, but it was necessary to fulfill the promise of God to His chosen people. He promised His people that He would fulfill His promise with a thousand year millennial reign of peace on earth. God promised the children of Israel a Savior from the bloodline of Abraham. And He promised that He would live with His chosen people and He would bring peace and He would bring purpose to their life. Now, loved ones, you don't have to be a history scholar to understand. Israel has never lived in peace. Never. God's chosen people have never known peace. The Pharaoh tried to annihilate them and throw the, the baby boys in the Nile. Queen Esther employed Haman and told him to go and destroy the Jews. King Nebuchadnezzar persecuted them. King Herod attempted Jewish genocide. Titus, the Roman general in 70 AD, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Adolf Hitler went on an all-out assault against the Jews. And today, today, history continues to repeat itself. Look what's happening in the Middle East. The Palestinian Hamas rebels continue to persecute the Jews. But I want you to know something. They can't win. None of them can stop King Jesus from fulfilling His promise. He will bring peace. In Isaiah chapter 60, Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, 
that I might be glorified. Jesus Christ is victorious by necessity. And I'm so glad it was necessary. Amen? And it's necessary not only for the Jewish people, it's necessary for you and for me. He died on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. He gave that gift to you and to me. His life was all about you and me. So when are we going to make our life about Him? When does that take place? How does that happen in our life? child from a manger is going to rule and reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. So the golden gift, it reminds us, this is not just a baby in a feed trough. Not at all. This is the royal and the sovereign king of glory. And his gifts just keep on giving. So right there in our passage this morning, we see that the first gift was gold. Grayson. Hey, Grayson, come here. I need you to help me, buddy. Come over here. This sack right here in the middle, would you hand that to me, please? That one right there. Thank you very much. Thank, okay, you can go back with Grandma. So we noticed the first gift that we were given in God's Word was gold. It's a gift of sovereignty. But the second gift we're told about in verse 11, opening their treasures, they offered Him gifts, gold and frankincense. Frankincense. Hmm. Frankincense is incense. Something that smells good. Sweet to savor. My Savior, the baby that was born in a manger, is something sweet to savor. His love is a sweet sin. But not only that, it's got a greater meaning. It's got a a deeper value. Because not only did they give a gift of sovereignty, they gave a gift of sanctity. And frankincense represents a gift of sanctity. The priest in the old original temple used to take frankincense. And over the hot coals of the altar where there were to be offered an offering by fire, the priest would take the frankincense and pour it over the altar. Pour it over the coals. And when the frankincense hit the coals, the smoke would rise up to heaven. And it was a picture to those that were worshiping in the temple that their God hears them. That their God is redeeming them. That their God is restoring them and that the frankincense is a sweet aroma that rises to the heavens. Now here's a little known fact. Frankincense in those days was prohibited to be owned by a normal citizen. You were not allowed to have frankincense. Frankincense was considered holy. It was something that only the priest in the temple was allowed to possess. It was set aside for God. Now look, these wise men, that, the firemen that came from afar, were pretty wise. Because not only did they bring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords a gift of sovereignty, but they brought Him a gift of Sanctity in worship. Something that was precious. 
I heard about a little boy one time that was scared at night. Called his mommy in and wanted mama to sleep with him. Anybody ever had that happen? I've done that a time or two in my life. Yeah, I've done it. Thank God for mom and dad that put up with me. Slept with me and hold me close. This little boy was scared. And he asked his mom to come sleep with him. And she sat on the side of his bed and she said, Honey, listen. I'll sleep with you, but you just need to remember Jesus is always with you. Jesus is here. The little boy looked at his mama and he said, Mom, I know that. I just need somebody with skin. Well, loved ones, listen to me. God the Father knew that we needed somebody with skin. Amen? We needed somebody that could relate to us. We needed somebody that knew how we felt. And that gift of sanctity represents Jesus in skin. And I'm thankful. The old song says, He was so much man that he slept in a boat, but he was so much God, the wind ceased when he spoke. He was so much man that he wept when Lazarus died. He was so much God that Lazarus came forth when he cried. He was so much man that he thirsted at the well, but he was so much God that he saved her soul from hell. He was so much man that he died upon a tree, but he was so much God that he rose in victory. We need to remember Jesus is the God-man. And He wasn't 50-50. Jesus is 100% God. And He was 100% man. And the Bible refers to Him as I Am. John 6.35 I Am the Bread of Life. John 8.12 I Am the Light of the World. John 10.7 I Am the Door. John 10.11 I Am the Good Shepherd. John 11.25 I'm the Resurrection and the Life. John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. The wise men knew this wasn't just a child. This was I am. This is the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. He's royal. He's sovereign. He's sanctified. He's recognized. And they brought Him a sanctified gift. A sanctified gift is a gift that's set aside. It's special. It's kept from any kind of adulteration. And that reminds me to think about us. When we're giving our gifts, our treasures, do we give sanctified gifts? Jesus? Are we wise enough to give a sanctified gift? Something that's set apart? Set aside? Special for the occasion? This was a sanctified gift. I thought about that old song, Let's Talk About Jesus. I like that. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is He, the Lord of lords is He through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. So loved ones, let's remember this morning, they brought Him a sovereign gift. They brought Him a sanctified but they also brought him a sacrificial gift. A gift of sacrifice. I think this is incredibly poignant. We look in verse 11. It says they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense. The last gift they offered him was myrrh. Myrrh. Myrrh is a spice. 
But there's a special agent in this spice. It's used to embalm dead bodies. It's used to anoint those who have already given up the ghost. And I want you to put this in your mind. Those wise men that traveled from afar and brought their gifts to Jesus recognized that He was sovereign because they brought Him gold. They recognized He was a Savior and they brought Him a sanctified gift. But they realized that He would be crucified and that He would die on the cross of Calvary. And they brought Him a sacrificial gift. The gift of myrrh to anoint the dead body. You remember after Jesus was taken down from the cross, He was laid in the tomb. The Bible tells us that Mary and Salome showed up one morning. And what did they show up to do? The Bible says they showed up to anoint the body of And you know what they brought with them to anoint the body of Jesus? They had myrrh. Now, you know, I know none of us know this, and I think it was Brother Larry and I were talking this week. We were talking something about the message, and he, I think he brought it up. I don't remember whether he brought it up or I did. It doesn't matter. But it was just interesting that we wondered. I wonder if Mary kept that same urn of myrrh. And I wonder when she showed up at the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, was it that, was it that same gift? Did she keep it knowing that the day would come when she could anoint the body of Jesus Christ? We don't know. We'll never know. And when we get to where we will know, we won't care. Amen? But isn't it a great thought? And have you ever thought about the inside of the wise men to know that they needed to bring a gift of sacrifice? The Magi that visited Jesus, they made a powerful statement with this myrrh. Listen to me this morning. Listen, if you don't get anything else out of this message, listen to this. They did not worship Him as a christened child. They worshiped Him as a crucified Savior. Right there in the Christmas story. It's right in front of our eyes. We never even see it. And I want you to know something this morning. If we worship Him as Savior, we'll worship Him with gifts that reflect His character. We'll worship Him with sovereign gifts. We'll worship Him with sanctified gifts. And listen, we'll worship Him with sacrificial You can tell how much somebody loves Jesus by just looking at what they give to Him. And I'm not just talking about money because I want you to know something. He don't need our money. He don't need it. He asks for our life. He asks for our heart. He asks for our love. And if I worship Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life, here's the gift I'll give Him. It's simple. Everything. I give Him everything. The songwriter Robin Mark wrote, All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I'll ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. And then he wrote, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. 
all. The Christ child is sovereign. The Christ child is sanctified. And the Christ child is sacrificial. And I want you to know His sovereignty is as good as gold. And His sanctity is as sweet smelling. Ooh. As the frankincense. But His sacrifice, His sacrifice is preserved forever and it keeps on giving and giving and giving and if you really love someone this Christmas and you want to really give them a gift that keeps giving and giving and giving you need to give them Jesus Jesus Christ the Son of the Living God the co-creator with God the Father of the entire expanse of the galaxy. So I ask you this morning, what gifts are you giving Jesus? Luke chapter 14 says, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in the Christmas season, the question is not, what gifts will I get? The real question is, what gifts will I give? And remember the gifts that keep on giving. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your blessed Word. Thank You for Your love and Your grace and Your mercy and Your goodness. Thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, the God of glory. Father, I ask You in Jesus' name that You would help us to put our values in place. To not fall for the trappings of the world. To not mingle the precious Son of God with paganism. Father, help us to remember He's sovereign. He's saint. He is sacrificial. He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. Help us give our life to You. Help us give our dreams to You. Help us give our hopes to You. And Father, help us to serve You and to love You. And I ask these things in the name of Emmanuel, God with